music? China? What do they even say? <laughs> what is this Chinese rap music? <laughs> Sounds like they're just saying Ching Chang Chong. My chance to go watch Made in China. We play ping pong ball Made in China. Hello and welcome to China Econ Talk. I'm your host, Jordan Schneider. So today is my birthday month. And for a present, I would very much appreciate you telling two friends about China Econ Talk. If you're listening to this show, presumably there is someone else in your life who is also interested in China or economics or technology or whatever else we talk about on this show. So what does Boeing, lithium-ion batteries, the Central Committee, and late 1970s diplomatic maneuvering have in common? Why? Neil Thomas, of course. Research associate at Macro Polo and longtime friend of the show. Neil, welcome to China Econ Talk. Thanks, Jordan. Great to be here. Let's kick ourselves off this week with your very long and extensive piece about Boeing's place in U.S.-China relations. You write that the relation between Boeing and China shows how structural changes in the international system over the past five decades have affected the commercial calculus of a powerful international firm. So before we dive into the history, I'm curious what caught your eye and got you down this rabbit hole in the first place. Yeah, I guess one of the things that I'm most interested in is exploring kind of under-examined areas of U.S.-China relations. And I think in general, the um, history of business and multinational corporations in China hasn't received quite the attention um, that it deserves vis-a-vis, you know, the obviously important political history, and you know, cultural history and social history. So I feel like companies like Boeing, KFC, and that's another one I've looked at, you know, they've played, been huge actors in this bilateral relationship. And um, Boeing happens to be one of the biggest and most interesting. So I think it uh, behooves us to study how they've affected bilateral relations, especially, you know, at the moment, given that you know, trade and companies relationship with China is really under the spotlight under the Trump administration. So have you ever ridden on one of those 737 Maxes? I'm not sure I have, actually. I mean, I kind of came to Boeing as someone interested in uh, history and U.S.-China relations rather than someone who was interested in aviation per se. Like I've, um, I had a friend in high school who was a plane spotter and, you know, used to go to the airport to look at the new planes landing, and, you know, follow flights on like flighttracker.com. And I kind of, um, I kind of thought he was crazy, but at least like doing this piece has made me, um, see, you know, realize how interesting, uh, this is and like how important it is to you know, geopolitics and to economic globalization. So currently Boeing's second biggest market outside the U.S. and China, and uh, Xi's jet is actually a 737. Boeing planes net currently fly hundreds of millions of Chinese nationals domestically in China and as well as to places abroad. So let's go all the way back to 1972. What's the connection between the Nixon admi- administration, China and Boeing? So everyone's familiar with uh, when Nixon went to China in February 1972. This was the big opening the U.S. made in the Cold War to, you know, align itself more closer with Beijing uh, in an effort to, you know, exert strategic pressure on the Soviet Union and Moscow. Uh, One of the things that is lesser known about that trip to China is that while he was there, Nixon personally approved a request from his uh, Chinese interlocutors to buy 10 Boeing 707s. Uh, Now, this was something that would require such high-level approval because jetliners are an apex technology. So they're very hard to build, and they're something that the U.S. kind of kept to its allies and countries that it was friendly with during the Cold War. Can you explain this this apex technology concept? For sure. Basically, it just means that uh, jetliners are really, really hard to build. Uh, so it involves a huge amount of uh, not only engineering expertise, but expertise at um, you know avionics, it's electronics, uh, software systems, and also like project management to pull it all together and to make sure that it's safe as well as that it works and that it works you know perfectly well every single time. Um, if you think about a plane, there's just so many different components that go into it, and there's really nothing more complex in transportation than a jetliner, at least on the, the civilian market. Yeah, it's one of those kind of um, extremely important technologies that you know underpins an entire 
global economy, and that's air travel. All right, so back to Kissinger and Nixon in China. So what were the motivations for, for Nixon to start selling planes to communist Mao-dominated China? It's crazy to think just how early this was. It was very early, actually. And actually, one of the things that's kind of often overlooked about late Maoism is that the high point of the Cultural Revolution was in the late 60s. You know, the PLA had basically you know, stamped out the Red Guards by 1969. So from then on, we see like a process of, you know, slow but gradual economic recovery. And things are, are getting better in the early 1970s um, before, you know, Mao dies and Deng kind of launches reform and opening in, in 78. But yeah, so in one part of this is that China wanted to bolster its transport sector domestically. It wanted to, you know, to have good airplanes because it really didn't. It only had about 350 to 500 planes for the entire country uh, for commercial use um, at that point. And a lot of these planes were very old. They're sometimes propeller planes, a lot of kind of obsolete Soviet technology from the 1950s. Yeah, I mean, we've had plenty of famous uh, Chinese politicians mysteriously or perhaps not so mysteriously die in plane crashes in the uh, 1950s, 60s and and 70s. Uh, Presumably some of these deaths are just due to the crappy Soviet planes that everyone was flying on. For sure. Though actually, the plane that Lin Biao crashed on in Mongolia in 1971, I think it was actually a British plane, a British jet plane. Oh. I, have to, I have to go back and check that, so don't quote me on it, but it was one of the more recent, more modern, and perhaps foreign imports that had come in 1970, 1971 time. I think it crashed basically because of it was either pilot error or the fact that they ran out of fuel over Mongolia, but um, there were certainly a lot of crashes uh, before then due to uh, in bad technology, bad training, uh, inadequate kind of air traffic control. China was one of the least safe uh, air markets in the entire world. Yeah, so I mean, one of the reasons, that was why, why Mao and why China wanted to acquire these jetliners. But from the point of view of Nixon and Kissinger and the uh, Washington administration, um, developing a, an American dependence on jetliners would be a way of kind of drawing Beijing even further away from Moscow, on which it had previously been dependent for jetliner technology, to Washington. And it was one quite significant but overlooked part of this turn from Sino-American estrangement to a Sino, Sino-American rapprochement. Yeah, Kissinger has this line that you quote saying, our interest in trade with China is not commercial. It is to establish a relationship that is necessary for the political relations uh, we both have. But on the other hand, it's also interesting because a side effect of kind of buying into uh, an American-led APEC technology is that it's not just the planes you're getting. You you have to get the trainers, you have to get the repair, um, you know, the the repair parts. It's a whole infrastructure that you're that you're kind of buying into. So once you decide to pick whichever plane you're going to buy, be that um, Boeing or Airbus, you're, you're locked into um, to buying into that whole system, which is a, a multiplier of just the upfront uh, ticket price of the planes themselves. So getting China hooked on Boeing, uh, I think the, the administration as well as Boeing itself realized was a potentially huge opportunity for them, even as, as early as the mid-1970s. So coming to the, the 1980s, how does Gaiga Kaifan impact this relationship? So Reform and opening, which uh, Deng Xiaoping kind of gets started in 1978, is, you know, it's a huge boost for Western companies like Boeing, and indeed companies from all over the place, because, you know, it's the start of this commitment towards you know, marketizing China's economy, the you know, foreign technology, foreign trade, foreign investment gradually begins to become more welcome. And, you know, Western business people have been obsessed with the China market you know, for centuries and centuries. So these kind of long dormant fantasies about uh, doing business in China kind of get reawakened by reform and opening. And so, you know, Boeing, for instance, it sets up its first uh, China office, a one-person office in 1980, um, and it begins to start to sell a large amount of planes to to China. So it's done two deals in the, the 70s, one in 72, the first one, another in 78. Um, which is, you know, about $150 million each in the in, you know, money then. Um, but over the 1980s, they sell, you know, in the couple of billion dollars worth of planes. And it's going to get into the dozens and dozens of planes now that China has acquired from Boeing. And that's basically just a response to, you know, rising demand in China for air travel, which tracks relatively closely to rising incomes that 
um, begin to flow from the economic reforms that Deng introduces. But the Chinese weren't necessarily completely satisfied by just buying Boeing planes. Why don't you tell the story of the Y-10? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, China did buy a lot of uh, airplanes from Boeing and other suppliers early on. It was kind of obvious for industry observers from almost the very outset that China preferred to build rather than buy whenever it can. And so one manifestation of this was that China, Chinese authorities demanded, you know, local production contracts as part of agreements to purchase planes, whereby, you know, Boeing would subcontract out a, you know, a small component like, you know, vertical fins or, uh, you know, cabin doors to a Chinese supplier. So they begin to learn how to build these things and also, you know, inject money and jobs into the Chinese economy. But they also wanted to build a, you know, a quote unquote Chinese Boeing. And this is where the, the, the Yun Ten or the Y Ten comes in. It was actually a, a project to build a Chinese jetliner that was begun um, during the Mao years, perhaps as early as 1970, by members of the, the infamous Gang of Four, actually, which apart from Jiang Qing were all, you know, senior cadres based in Shanghai, kind of helped Mao uh, solidify the Cultural Revolution in Shanghai. And that's kind of one of the reasons why they kind of got catapulted into, you know, the top of elite politics in Beijing. And so they figured out that, you know, the the Imperial West and the, you know, Soviet revisionists had these amazing jetliners. And so China should kind of get in on the act too, because China had recently built its own atom bomb, its own hydrogen bomb, its own satellite. So they started this project. How hard could planes be? (laughs) Yeah. extremely difficult as they found out um so they begun doing this in the early 70s and wouldn't you know it in 1972 the authorities in in beijing agree to buy uh 10 of these boeing 707s and that's the first deal that boeing signs in china as we alluded to earlier um so the uh, the shanghai uh, aviation industrial corporation which is the uh, unit running this project um becomes very interested in these boeing 707s and the uh, the forty odd, you know, highly advanced Pratt and Whitney engines that come with the deal, and they begin to work on uh, what has been referred to as a, a virtual clone of the Boeing seven hundred seven uh, in their facility in Shanghai. And this reverse engineered aircraft is called the the Yun Ten or the Y Ten. And so it takes a long time for them to do this reverse engineering because you know, the Chinese economy and the Chinese scientific sector has been rather decimated by the Cultural Revolution and general neglect over the last couple of decades. But in September 1980, it's actually a, a visiting delegation of, uh, of American engineers kind of stumble across this plane in a hangar that are touring in Shanghai. Someone obviously you know, forgot, to, forgot to get the memo to close the door on the, on the hangar. But um, <laughs> they see this thing, you know, it's kind of labeled the Y-10, and it looks exactly like uh, a Boeing 707. And this is how it kind of gets discovered. But this this plane, you know, has its maiden flight in 1980, and it can fly. It flies to Urumqi in Xinjiang. It flies to uh, Lhasa in Tibet, and it basically works. But the problem is that that it doesn't work nearly as well as the latest generation of uh, Boeing or Airbus planes. Engineers struggle to pinpoint the center of gravity and the materials they use, like steel rather than aluminium, uh, made the plane really heavy and really fuel inefficient. So basically, it's taking a long time even to reverse engineer these, uh, you know, ladder grade Boeing 707s in you know, the early 1980s. So a decision was made in Beijing basically to scrap the Y10 project um, because they figured that, you know, they were going to have much more success in just like, opening up air travel and in stimulating the domestic economy by buying much more advanced models from overseas. And so, you know, from Boeing and from Airbus. Um, so, yeah, the funding was cut in 1984. And the last uh, Y-10 now sits rather forlornly outside of the uh, Comac facility in Shanghai, where it is actually kind of seen as an inspiration for China's current efforts to build its own uh jetliner that the c919 so uh you know on my youtube rabbit holes uh, all, every once in a while i come onto these videos of people flying classic planes so you you know these videos of like world war ii veterans getting back into spitfires and they come out and say oh my god this is such a joy to fly you know it reminds so many great memories and like it controls so much better than all this new stuff i'm not sure there are too many people with um uh such uh, uh positive memories of a plane that 
had center of gravity issues. That sounds a little concerning, but uh, interesting that it's still, um, you know, you can still go and uh, check it out on your next visit to, to, to Shanghai. Yeah, there's actually um, kind of interesting debates in the Chinese, you know, blogosphere where people argue about the real reason that the, um, the funding was cut, like were, were Boeing and Airbus kind of conspiring with, you know, um, traitorous elements of the Chinese government to, you know, uh, strangle China's aerospace development in its crib, like were there bribes involved um, or was it, you know, total incompetence and that, you know, it was a real shame for the Chinese nation that they couldn't do this um, by themselves yet. So actually it's a very contentious um, source of debate amongst, you know, Chinese economic nationalists online and those who are, you know, favor a more internationalist system. So it's still, a, you know, it's a live issue that, you know, there's a lot of very positive and adulatory profiles of the Y10's uh, engineers and um, its kind of uh, project leads that are in state media. So it's still like very much part of like the, the living memory of China's, you know, techno-nationalist aspirations. I think I think a, 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 an article, if you want to write it, about uh, Chinese uh, uh, economic, cons- U.S.-China economic conspiracy theories. I think that could be um, uh, that could be something definitely worth an episode for sure. Oh yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking about writing uh, something that's more specifically focused on the Y10 and kind of getting into you know what it means, what it meant at the time, what it means today, and kind of how it's remembered and how it kind of feeds into this uh, desire for. Uh, technological independence in these apex technologies can you fly it in any chinese video games that i don't know but i wouldn't be surprised i also never played those like uh simulator vid- airplane video games was it wasn't cool enough <laughs> so um so in the 1980s uh one more bit about it you you had this great quote of reagan saying that he admired the free market spirit of quote so-called communist china and said that it was unnecessary for quote us to impose our form of governments on on some other country which i think is an interesting uh reference point for the uh current debate we have uh, today in the in the u.s for but, sure um, uh, Anyways, neither here nor there. Back to uh, 2089 to 2001, and the broad arc of this was the uh, MFN debate. So what was going on there, and how did uh, Boeing fit into all of this? So MFN refers to a most favored nation, uh, which is a status that a country gives to another country, which means that that recipient country can kind of enjoy all of the trade benefits that it grants to, to everyone else. So MFN status for China was something that was uh, initially granted in in 1980 by Jimmy Carter, helped along by a little bit of lobbying from Boeing in Congress. But this was something that was particularly important for China because there was an amendment to a trade act in 1974 called the Jackson-Vanik Amendment that meant that the MFN status for any quote-unquote non-market economy, uh, which restricted emigration, which includes China, had to be reissued by the president every single year. So it wasn't just a case of a one-off, right, we're going to grant China most favored nation status in 1980, that's it. The president had to keep on making a decision to renew that status um, because China fell under this uh, Jackson-Vanik Amendment. So Reagan renewed the MFN status without any controversy throughout the 1980s. Um, And actually, the quote you mentioned before kind of goes to show how China's U.S., policy towards China in the 1980s was very much shaped by the Cold War and the desire to you know, keep China on side uh, as a way to pressure the Soviet Union. And um, that really kind of dominated uh, elite decision making towards China right up until uh, the fall of communism and Tiananmen Square. So MFN status wasn't an issue in the 1980s, but then you have the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, uh, June 4th, and this totally flips the American public's perception of China. Um, Public opinion literally goes from about 70% positive a month or two before the crackdown to about 30% positive a month or two afterwards. It's a huge flip. Wow. China's profile in American politics, in American domestic politics, rises really sharply because of this, Um, particularly with regard to democracy and human rights, which are becoming you know, increasing focuses of American foreign policy since the Carter administration in 1977 to 81. Um, and, you know, Congress began to assume and assert a much greater role for itself in US-China relations. And so this MFN uh, status that China has, the requirement for the president to renew it every year, 
just happen to provide a very convenient focus point for pressure on the, the Bush 41 administration uh, on its China policy, because uh, they wanted to basically maintain a policy of what they dubbed engagement, that is, you know, continuing high level contacts with uh, Beijing and an effort to kind of manage the fallout from Tiananmen and to continue to draw China into global institutions, uh, into global trade, into you know, global security arrangements. Because um, America and China were very close in security policy in the 1980s because of the you know, continuing uh, Soviet factor. Uh, and so MFN became this convenient uh, focus point for, for critics of China who wanted to you know, use access to American markets that is, you know, tariff-free access to American markets, which is what MFN gave to pressure China to improve its performance on human rights, to improve a whole range of things that they thought could be could be changed by, you know, potentially cutting this MFN status and making Chinese exports to America much more expensive, and therefore likely severely reducing them. And so, right throughout. Uh, his administration, um, George H.W. Bush, manages to survive some really intense congressional fights over MFN status. Uh, he manages to uh, maintain MFN status in 1989, 1990, 1991. Basically, yeah. It's interesting thinking about this like re- recurring vote thing. It, it almost reminds me of the debt ceiling fights where every two years there's an opportunity for everyone to kind of voice their opinion on the debt uh on the on the federal government debt just like uh you kind of had this nice little focal point for everyone who was upset with the way uh the chinese government handled uh 1989 to uh to voice their uh frustration and um uh, frustration with with chinese policy but it's interesting how um uh, you talk a little bit about how uh, mfn had impacts on chinese internal politics you want to go there for a little bit I think MFN status. Um, was... I didn't ask that super well. Oh, let's do that one time. So, um, all right, we'll just cut the de- the debt ceiling thing. Is not really relevant. So, how did uh, most favored nation status impact in Chinese domestic? So, how did most favored nation status impact Chinese politics domestically? Well, most favored nation status was something that the uh, central leadership in Beijing was incredibly keen on because, I mean, uh, China was beginning to become more of an export powerhouse, um, was beginning to you know, rely a lot more on trade for its economic growth, um, mostly through you know, cheap and lower end manufacturing, but increasingly moving up the value chain. And MFN status was essential really to remain competitive in the American market which was a you know, not insignificant part of um, Beijing's overall trade. But there were some domestic constituencies that were very opposed to opening economic opening with the West, and that's primarily found in the state sector. So big state and enterprises that stand only to lose from reform, to lose from being competed against by foreign imports, um, to lose from the market reforms that would be necessary to you know, join the global trading regime, um, and that would lose from, you know, com- competition from, you know, foreign invested firms that were starting to uh, spring up in China. And so you see these um, domestic constituencies within China actually, you know, try to organize um, on, a, on a higher level as China begins its you know, more serious world tr- trade organization accession talks in, in the late 90s, particularly with the US. So someone like uh, Zhu Rongji, the Chinese premier in the late 90s who kind of led this WTO accession effort, you know, he had significant domestic constituencies who were you know, saying that he was basically trying to sell out China to the Americans and that you know, WTO accession would be you know, the end of party control in China. And it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, how much resistance there was in some parts of the Chinese government to WTO accession, whereas the, the memory in you know, Washington now is that Yes, China WTO accession was this kind of vast conspiracy that Beijing managed to, you know, foist upon the world and that, you know, China had been plotting this for a long time, which is kind of basically rubbish because, you know, some of the the, the hardliners in Beijing were very much against WTO accession. There really sure, wasn't sure. 
as much anticipation of you know the the astounding economic performance that China had in the 2000s after WTO accession as we have now. So coming coming to the other side of this of uh, this debate of WTO accession, you have Clinton and Bush too, both doing their part to push normalization of U.S. China trade relations. And you write about how Clinton is perhaps best remembered for the argument that economic freedom would foster political change in China, saying that, quote, the genie of freedom will not go back into the bottle. But it's interesting uh, thinking about just the where where the discussion is in 2019, how many other people agreed with that uh, that line of thinking. You have a, a, a quote from Human Rights Watch saying that uh, tra- trade with China is, a, is good for trade, but also for human rights and the rule of law. So this wasn't really a niche view basically every most people on the uh on the on the uh, political spectrum really bought into the idea that uh more trade and more engagement would lead to political change that was certainly one of the important arguments made and i mean it's in the piece because it's one of the arguments that boeing made because boeing was one of the leading corporate lobbyists in the 1990s that was fighting for china's mfn status each year and then for WTO accession and what was called you know, permanent normal trade relations. So no longer having to um, recertify China's MFN status each year, which was passed in, uh, in 2000. Um, but this was only one of many arguments that were present for China's WTO accession. Because I think right now, the, the shorthand you see in all of the media reporting and analysis is that Clinton let China into the WTO because everyone thought China would become a democracy and it didn't. So therefore, this is a terrible mistake. Um, but there are actually a whole lot of other arguments made for China's accession that were, were valid. And you know, in terms of like the benefits realized, actually much more important. So you know, there was huge arguments made for you know, America's economy, America's trade, American consumers would benefit. Some American jobs would indeed benefit in the, you know, the higher tech, higher value added service sectors, for instance. And also there was a need, it was felt to you know, uh, incorporate China into global trading regime. So you wouldn't really have a global trading regime uh, without China. Uh, and there's also a need to you know, get China's cooperation on you know, bigger strategic issues like um, nuclear prol- proliferation, like climate change, all of these things were big issues, even in the you know, the mid and late 1990s. And all of these were actually part of Clinton's argument for China's accession that he laid out in a major speech in March 2000. It's just that that kind of modernization theory argument about trade and uh, economic growth leading to democracy that's really stuck in our memory, partly perhaps because it was it turned out not to be true. But then, like you said, a lot of people, a lot of China watchers, um, George W. Bush, everyone in Silicon Valley, most House Republicans, a lot of House Democrats, and you know a lot of prominent Chinese dissidents and you know Hong Kong Democrats um, all thought that WTO accession would be good for China's governance. And I mean, you could probably make an argument up until Xi Jinping that you were seeing progress on a lot of issues. Slow progress in an authoritarian context, for sure. But um, there was no guarantee that Xi Jinping was going to come along and do what he did that was highly inevitable so you know there's a lot that's gone wrong but that argument really wasn't even the central argument for securing china's accession to the wto i mean the business and economic benefits argument was actually very prominent in those debates well you know there's 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 still a big debate within the economic literature on just to what extent the quote china shock had on uh, the u.s economy but boeing most certainly was a big beneficiary so in the 2000s you write that china was basically the only growth market for boeing as um you know an early economic downturn in the early 2000s and 9 11 put a lot of brakes on big airline purchases but at the same time they have to start navigating comac which enters the scene so what was this organization and how did it affect the the kind of calculus that Boeing was making in its engagement with China? Yeah, so China announced its kind of revitalized plans to you know, build a commercial jetliner like the Y-10 in 2006. And it reorganized its entire domestic aerospace industry to create COMAC, which is the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China in 2008, um, which is based in Shanghai and is a, it's a massive state-owned enterprise. And 
its kind of mission is to yeah lead China's commercial aviation program. And that's got two main focuses. It's the one is the a regional jet, which is like a 75 to 90 seater airplane, which is called the ARJ-21. And the other is the kind of the flagship product, which is a, a narrow body jetliner, which seats about 150, 160 people called the C919. And that's intended to compete with the, um, the Boeing 737 and the Airbus 320, which are the, you know, the most common uh, aircraft in the world and kind of underpin a lot of the fleets of most, you know, commercial aviation companies. So what's happened to an increasing extent once COMEX got started is that, you know, Boeing and Airbus, the two major jetliner uh, companies in the world, which basically have a duopoly over these, you know, narrow body and wide body, larger commercial jetliners are being asked more and more to share their technology with China and to engage in kind of co-production agreements. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, this is not new. I mean, this is something China's had an eye on this ever since the first, you know, co-production agreements were signed in about 1980, but the, the level of the technology that's involved has been being turned up by COMAC. But still, I mean, there's a lot of worry about what these collaborations can do. And there are some fairly advanced collaborations, particularly on uh, engines and avionics um, with, for example, General Electric. But um, Boeing and Airbus, whilst needing to enter into these agreements to stay competitive in, in China and to make sure that the other companies and eat their, their share of airline orders, they're not stupid about the technology transfer piece and um They've consistently tried to you know, guard their most competitive technology from transfer to China or to anywhere, really. And I mean, there's this trick that Boeing leaders have you know, referred to publicly for years of basically wanting to give away technology that's just about to become obsolescent and it's just about to be replaced by the next generation of technology and aircraft. So the firm has transferred technology, but it hasn't transferred the main game of what makes Boeing so innovative what makes it the, the industry leader in you know, commercial jetliners. But the pressure to do this is kind of heating up. And, you know, just last year, Boeing opened its, its first um, you know, finishing uh, plant, which, you know, kind of puts the finishing touches on commercial aircraft. Its first one overseas opened in Shanghai late last year. And you see a similar thing with Airbus and the level of collaboration and cooperation is intensifying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting uh, comparing the the experience of other countries trying to create their own uh, domestic commercial, um, uh, you know, to create their own domestic commercial airplanes. You, you talk about how Korea and Japan, countries that have a lot of experience, you know, have been able to create a lot of very successful high technology products, have really struggled on this. There's a great a chapter in the book, How Asia Works, on the boondoggle that was the Indonesian effort to make a um, an airline. But, you know, on the one hand, no one's ever done it before. But if there's any country that could do it, perhaps uh, China with its um, uh, potential uh, market size and uh, uh, commitment that the state is dangling in front of it may be the one to um, uh, maybe the one to finally uh, break through the, the Airbus, uh, the Airbus Boeing duopoly. In the airline industry, it's in, it's interesting that it's one of these sort of exceptions where, on the one hand, uh, you often hear Western companies uh, complaining about the amount of subsidies that uh, national champions get in China, uh, but a lot of people uh, forget that Airbus and and Boeing have huge amounts of uh, generous R and D grants, uh, military contracts, and tax breaks, which have really been able to build them to the place that they are today. Yeah, and, and just recently, there's been some rulings handed out in a massive WTO case with you know suits and countersuits brought by the U.S. government and by the European Union against you know Airbus and against Boeing. Um, and whilst the EU has probably been a little bit more uh, naughty with the subsidies that it's given to Airbus, you know, a lot of concessional launch loans um, and other kind of preferential treatments, you know, it's still true that the U.S. has provided fairly generous you know, R&D grants, you know, preferential military contracts, as you say, and you know, various tax breaks at the federal and state level. Uh, and there's been some rulings uh, for lesser amounts against the US. So I mean, it's just kind of the nature of these you know, apex industries. They rely so much on having you know, a very highly trained workforce, on having the ability to 
uh, conduct you know, large amounts of research and development to you know, kind of stay ahead of the competitors on innovation. And they are very strategically important as well because you know, a lot of this technology is dual use um, and because the, the industry it, by nature, at least at the moment, it's a duopoly. So enormous commercial advantage flows to those who, who master that industry. At the moment, that's just um, the US and the EU uh, through Boeing and Airbus. So there's you know, every reason to see why China would want to break into this uh, industry and is throwing huge amounts of resources towards trying to make that happen, even if it still has a fair way to go yet. So I just spent two years at a master's program in China in China studies and doing it, I watched a lot of ITE, but didn't necessarily gain too many hard skills. Had I only known that at the University of San Francisco's new master in applied economics, I could have learned something to actually make me super employable. You know, R, SQL, machine learning, all that good stuff you actually see on job listings in Silicon Valley and Zhong Wansun, not necessarily have you watched all of Wan La Song. So in this program, you can study the economics of platforms, auctions, and business strategy at the same time as you learn the tools of econometrics, and experimental design, and machine learning. Plus, for all those non-U.S. students out there, this program is designated STEM, so you can apply for a three-year extension on your student visa and keep working in the U.S. after you graduate. To learn more and get an application fee waiver, go to usfca.edu slash Jordan. So, Neil, uh, talking about another potential apex industry, uh, what are your thoughts on lithium-ion batteries and the electric vehicle market? Well, they are... Getting much bigger is the general uh, underlying <laughs> thought that, that I have. Um, yeah, so my, my colleague Damien and I recently uh, published a piece in Foreign Policy about uh, lithium-ion battery supply chains that's uh, based on a product on the Macro Polo website, which uh, takes you through the story of this supply chain. Um, and basically, the, the finding is that uh, if we compile all the data on what's available for the, the upstream, midstream, and downstream supply chain, we find that a lot of that production is concentrating in East Asia and particularly in China. And so given that, you know, electric cars are going to jump from something like, like 3 million on the road now to something like 200 to 300 million in 20 odd years time, um, and, you know, are going to actually start to outnumber um, traditional, you know, gas powered cars in terms of new sales by the middle of the century. It's a really important industry. And I mean, if the United States government thinks that it's important to develop a domestic supply chain and the kind of um, innovation clusters and spillover benefits that result from that, then it's kind of going to need to get its act together with, you know, funding the research and offering, you know, kind of the uh, early industry support it did for companies like Boeing um, to, you know, to what is at the moment the only really serious concern in the US that is doing this, and that is Tesla. Uh, even though we, they're the kind of company that everyone loves to hate, and you know, Elon Musk is you know running here and there doing all sorts of crazy things. Having hot pot in, uh, in Shanghai, right? Yeah, and they're opening a gigafactory on the outskirts of Shanghai um, to you know, produce th- th- these lithium ion batteries, which they do you know, in collaboration with uh, Panasonic. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're kind of, they're jumping ship from the U S and it's, you know, something that the U S government should think about. I mean, the U S doesn't want to obviously, you know, copy the, um, industrial policy and you know, totally state led growth model that China has, because there's you know, enormous inefficiencies that result from that. But in terms of promoting policies that encourage consumers to make the switch to electric vehicles and you know, encouraging domestic startups and domestic mining explorers to exploit the potential and reserves that America does have. That's something that China has pursued aggressively, and it's worked. Often, you know, these most innovative products of the next generation come out of you know government or state sponsored or led or encouraged research. You know, it's something that the U.S. should be thinking about more seriously, particularly as it seems fairly likely that electric vehicles will, you know, start to dominate the roads, you know, at least by mid-century, if not a bit earlier. Does anyone remember Solyndra? I think it, if it just, you know, this, uh, this I think uh, the, in the Obama administration in 2010 and 2011. So in the stimulus package, uh, way back then after the uh, 
after the the Great Recession kicked off, um, there was a big push to support uh, companies and give them uh, below market loans. So Tesla is a is a huge recipient of one of them, and and I think a number of there's been plenty of reporting talking about how had Tesla not gotten cheap land and cheap loans from the U.S. government, they would not be where they are today by any stretch of the imagination. So. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's an interesting argument you make saying that the U.S. needs to do more support for it. But but actually, I think there's actually been a, a fair amount of, you know, tax subsidies for these cars in the U.S., um, but not necessarily on the level that, uh, that that China has really invested into trying to make sure that they are the, uh, the, the leaders in this field going forward. What you refer to was the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program that you know, did you know, provide some crucial early support for Tesla in the form of, you know, loans and, and accessible credit. But it actually hasn't made a, a loan since about 2011. Like it has about $16 billion of lending capacity that just hasn't used. Part of that is a, you know, a supply issue. Like you have to make sure that these companies are legit and there were some applying that perhaps didn't deserve the loan program. But there's pretty credible reporting out there that a lot of, you know, promising startups have been waiting for money to get going, you know, for years and years now. Um, and that, you know, there's no reason why that $16 billion that's been hanging around for eight years now, you know, shouldn't be used to try and encourage um, some of these companies, even if there are, you know, a couple of failures along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason is politics. Uh, this was a front page news story, uh, the Solyndra loans getting blown up, even though I think the overall uh, Department of Energy portfolio ended up making a fair amount of money on all of these, um, all of the loans they gave out. It, this is just as not something that China needs to worry about. The bureaucrats who are writing these checks um, are not up for re-election. Um, these sorts of uh, stories, there, there is not a Fox News that will be waving them in the government's face, or I guess a, a you know an MSNBC. If Trump is going to be giving out loans, which people decide, um, which you know people may say they're sweetheart deals for his uh, business associates or what have you, it's a real interesting kind of fallout from a lot of different aspects about the two countries. Is that even if a president wanted to uh, do this sort of big industrial push, it would be very difficult because it's very easy to kind of weaponize these sorts of um, these sorts of programs in the political uh, landscape that the U.S. currently has. Yep, it's certainly not easy to uh, to do things like this. But, you know, I think there is a growing kind of constituency for, for it, especially if it's framed in this kind of industrial um, competition type lens. I mean, you even have some fairly prominent Republicans getting behind what is essentially, you know, industrial policy for America's tech sector because of, you know, the the fear of China and, you know, China's supposedly all-conquering tech sector. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. There's a lot of dynamics shifting at the moment uh, because of the international situations that I think, you know, might make such programs more politically palatable in the next few years. Yeah, I know that that is a really interesting dynamic to think about, you know, what Republicans are going to think. On the one hand, you know, you have this aversion to government handouts to companies and and you know crony capitalism and what have you but on the other hand you know you read stories about you know the u.s is such a mess we can't even build our own 5g network without relying on europeans or chinese and uh whether or not those sorts of arguments will actually change the calculation of um of folks on the hill is a really interesting uh story to follow going going forward for sure so let's talk about negotiating with the chinese so it's uh, today is April 19th, and uh, we've just had some new news saying that apparently the trade deal is going to be wrapped up in May. Uh, God knows if that's uh, actually going to be the case. But uh, one of the very important things that uh, you know every nation has learned in negotiating with the Chinese is the importance of the language. So you have a f uh, you have a fascinating op-ed posted uh, a few weeks ago back in the Washington Post, which goes into the details of the um, the Chinese and English wording of an important document in the late 1970s. So you want to tell us this story, Neil? Absolutely, and it's relevant for the present because. The U.S. and China are currently negotiating in English, um, and Beijing will be decided to translate that draft agreement into Chinese. And there's some worry that um, in this translation, China could kind of water down some of its commitments by 
you know, playing around a little bit with the specificity or vagueness of the language in the text. And the reason why this, I think, should be something the Trump administration is paying attention to is because uh, there's been problems that have happened uh, in this area before, particularly with regards to the uh, so-called normalization communique that uh, you know, did what it says on the cover. It normalized uh, U.S.-China relations um, in 1979, although it was uh, released in December 1978. Um, and this is particularly relevant when it comes to uh, the U.S. is a one China policy where the U.S., you know, it acknowledges both Beijing's claim to sovereignty over Taiwan, but also Taiwan's claim to any, you know, some Taiwanese claims to independence, but it doesn't accept any of the, either of those positions. So it's kind of a diplomatic balancing act. Um, and so the Shanghai communique, which is kind of the famous document that uh, Nixon and Zhou Enlai signed in, in Shanghai in February 72, when he was visiting um, said that the, the United States would, um, I'll, I'll quote it, uh, acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. And so in this normalization communique, which kind of delivered on the promise of 72 that they were going to move towards normalization, um, says that the, um, the U.S. acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. So you'll notice that both those phrases start with the, the English word acknowledges. But when those documents are being translated in 79, the, the Chinese word for acknowledges actually changes in the 1979 document. It goes from the 1972 version, which is Run Shidao, which is kind of, you know, it's about like you, you know something, you understand it, you're you know acknowledging it in that sense, to the stronger verb uh, Cheng Ren, which is more about like, you know, uh, assent, recognizing it in that sense. So it's a, a stronger uh, sense of American acceptance of Beijing's position. And this is a bit strange because, you know, the Shanghai communique was kind of seen by people in the, the Carter administration as the, you know, the holy writ of uh, US-China relations, and they didn't want to depart from it. And it seems here that uh, the U.S. side has agreed to a, you know, a stronger statement of Beijing's view rather than their own you know, more independent uh, one China policy. And I mean, this happened because the, the U.S. liaison office that was the kind of de facto embassy before you know, official normalization in 79 uh, managed to get convinced by the Chinese negotiating side that uh, the word Cheng Ren was, you know, Substantively, oh, no big deal, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, no substantive significance. Not, not any different, you know. And uh, there's this this kind of funny quote in a memo that sent. It's uh, it's one ca it's one character shorter. We're just saving space. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, apparently, uh, several English Chinese dictionaries uh, were used to help convince the American side. Um, but there's this kind of really interesting memo that I found, kind of scrolling through the archives uh, one day, that kind of forms the basis of the piece where um, Michael Oxenberg, who is a kind of famous China scholar and the, um, the China kind of point man on Carter's National Security Committee, he notices this a few days after the communique has been released, um, and he gets very worried about this change in language. And he sends a, a memo to uh, Zbigny Brzezinski, who is the National Security Advisor for Carter, uh, kind of warning him that this mistake has been made and kind of acknowledging it as such. And he's recognize that you know linguists will say that this is a, a stronger acceptance of the the chinese position and so so this has been this difference in language has been known for uh, for quite some time by you know scholars of, of u.s china relations um you know, it's not kind of commonly uh known but i mean what i another thing that i found as i was kind of thinking about this memo um was i you know kind of searched through some chinese sources and found uh, a document that I don't think has received any attention before. That's kind of the recollection of a Chinese government translator who reminisces about being in, in the room when a senior diplomat called uh, Zhang Wenjin actually purposely changes that Chinese phrasing of, of Ren Shidao to Cheng Ren for the normalization communique in 79 for the stated reason at the time that this new word, Cheng Ren, was more in line with uh, Beijing's policy on Taiwan. So it just kind of shows that the 
you know, canny Chinese negotiating side managed to you know, mislead the uh, US liaison office into accepting wording that is helping China's you know, domestic position that, you know, other countries should acknowledge and accept rather than just, you know, be aware of um, its claim to sovereignty over Taiwan. So, you know, this hasn't actually like had much effect on US policy, but, you know, in terms of uh, China's, you know, continuing efforts to try and, you know, assert uh, Hua Yuquan, you know, discourse power, um, it's kind of a, not something you'd want them to have in their back pocket to be able to make a, even a contentious case that, you know, America has accepted um, uh, Beijing sovereignty over over Taiwan. If any of those language students out there need any extra motivation to, to get those HSK six plus words uh, down cold, like here you go, right? Yeah. Read the Chinese, know what the Chinese means and make your own decisions rather than having your negotiator. Yeah. Don't let Chinese people tell you what Chinese means. Well, I mean, I mean, to be honest, they know a lot more I mean, about yeah, it than yeah, I do, but, but like if you're in a diplomatic <laughs> negotiation, then you'd want to have the capacity on your own side to be able to make your own judgments uh, about this. And, you know, there were some timing and chain of command issues that came into the, the American blunder. But um, yeah, you don't you want to be making your own decisions rather than having your negotiating partner tell you what you should be thinking about things. So Chinese diplomats have been having fun playing games with um, with Mandarin for thousands of years at this point. So coming back to one of our favorite features on China Econ Talk, the Imperial Interlude. Back in 1044, the Liao dynasty was giving the, the Song a run for their money. And basically, this is the famous moment in Chinese history where the Song decided to buy off the Liao by uh, sending them 20,000 ounces of silver, 24,000 bolts of various silk textiles, 10,000 caddies of tea. Aside from the monetary aspect of this, uh, of this diplomatic deal, there was also the kind of respect in where people sat on the totem pole. Uh, one of the big stresses on the part of the Song Dynasty was worrying that they would have to acknowledge another ruler as as you know an older brother or something that hasn't necessarily fit into the uh, the Chinese worldview of the Chinese Huangdi being the, the the kind of top dog on the planet. So what the Liao and the uh, Song diplomats agreed to was instead of fighting as to whether or not they should call the Liao a uh, Wang or a king or a emperor they just settled on the word on the word for ruler zhu so as everyone's favorite imperial scholar of china fw moat wrote the song agreed to bypass the delicate problem of whether to address the xiao ruler as king or as emperor by referring to him in interstate documents simply as the ruler of xia or zhu like zhu ren which i think was a, a pretty clever way of sidestepping the uh, the issue and maybe this sort of creativity is just what the u.s and chinese negotiators need to uh, to find a solution to uh the, the current ongoing trade war. Perhaps. So I think the uh, Trump administration probably wants as much specificity uh, as it can in terms of you know, enforcement mechanisms and commitments to end uh, technology transfer. But in terms of you know, issues of- uh, As long as you're getting 20,000 bolts of silk, I think the, uh, the, uh, the Trump administration might be okay. If that's what it takes to buy more American soybeans, then that's what it'll take. <laughs> Neil, thanks for coming on China Econ. 